Hi folks, my name is Eric Osterberg and I'm an associate professor in the Earth Sciences Department here at Dartmouth College in beautiful Hanover, New Hampshire. Today we're going to talk about how climate change a couple hundred years ago can actually tell us something about human-caused climate change today and maybe even how we might be able to fight it in the future. But before we get to all that, I want to tell you a little bit about who I am as a person. So uh, when I'm not here at Dartmouth working on my research and teaching, I'm pretty much spending all my time with my family, with my wife and our two kids. We have a 10 year old and a seven year old, both boys. And we really enjoy just doing pretty much anything that we can outdoors, taking the biggest advantage of everything that New Hampshire has to offer. So in the winter time, that means you can usually find us uh, just up the road here at our local skiway where my boys are both competitive downhill skiers and I help out by assisting coaching their team for the last couple years. So pretty much every evening in our backyard or every weekend you'll find us downhill skiing. In the summertime that means that we're usually pretty much anywhere near or on the water. Uh, we really just love the water. My wife and I actually met on the swim team in college and uh, our boys are just like us, pretty much, if it's on the water, in the water, they love doing it. So everything from uh, boating, sailing, paddling, uh, even rope swinging is a big one these days. Uh, of course, swimming, snorkeling, windsurfing, you name it, if it's on the water, we love doing it in the summertime. And then in the uh, shoulder seasons, what we call the mud season here in spring, and of course the stick season in fall, that's when you can pretty much find us uh, hiking or biking and we play tennis as much as we can pretty much any season. Here at Dartmouth, my teaching and my research is really focused on climate change. And I study climate change on a whole range of timescales. Everything from natural climate change that happened in the deep past, so we're talking hundreds of years ago, sometimes even thousands or tens of thousands of years ago, all the way up to human-caused climate change, which is happening today. And I even dabble a little bit in what the future might be like using climate models on supercomputers. When I'm studying the natural climate of the deep past, most of that research is done in the polar regions. So I go to uh, Greenland, I go to Alaska and Antarctica, and I collect ice cores from the glaciers there, which preserve a history of how the climate used to behave before human activities started messing things up. So this allows us to understand the fundamentals of how the climate system works and see really interesting times in the past when the climate changed dramatically through natural processes. And that allows us to understand better what's actually happening today with human forcing from greenhouse gases. When I'm studying modern climate change, I'm often still going to these polar regions and collecting ice cores and trying to figure out things like how fast Greenland is melting today and actually raising sea level around the world. But in addition to the ice cores, I'll also use weather station records. So these are records of temperature and wind speed, atmospheric pressure that we actually get from weather stations that have been in operation for maybe the last several decades, maybe up to a century or even longer, but not much more than say 150 years at the very longest. And these allow us to really understand the details, usually the day-to-day -day changes in the weather and what's causing those sorts of changes. So we've been able to install weather stations in some pretty crazy places at the tops of mountains in Alaska or in the middle of the ice sheets. And that allows us to understand some of the details of how climate has been changing recently over those last several decades to really understand how human activities are changing things. What we're going to do today is focus on a natural climate change event that happened over 200 years ago in the summer of 1816. So today is a beautiful summer day here in Hanover, but I want you to cast your mind back to the summer of 1816. And in that time, we have anecdotal reports that it was really unusually cold here in New England and actually all the way over in Western Europe as well. We have reports from farmers that their crops were failing, that this beautiful green vegetation you see here, back in the summer of 1816, it would have looked dried and withered. And what we want to try and understand is what the heck happened to make the climate so unusually cold in the summer of 1816? And what we'd like to be able to do is first see just how cold was it, and then try and see if we can understand why. The problem is that we don't actually have a great record of how cold it actually was in 1816. 
some of the longest weather station data we actually had anywhere in the world comes from right here in Hanover, New Hampshire. This station goes back to 1827. But even that doesn't get us far enough back to actually see really what was going on in 1816. So in order to answer that question, we actually need to use other records of climate in the past. Not thermometers, but we, we, we need to use these natural archives that I was talking about in the glaciers. And actually we can look at another one from places like right here in Hanover, and that's tree ring records. So I want you to imagine a tree, and of course you can imagine that trees have certain weather and climate conditions that they like in order to grow. So in summers when it's warmer and there's more rainfall, the trees are generally happier and can grow more. In summers like the summer of 1816, when it was colder and maybe there wasn't so much rainfall, then the trees are going to struggle a little bit and we're not going to see as much growth in the trees. Now trees conveniently grow every single summer and they record that growth in a series of annual growth rings. So we can actually look at these growth rings, see how thick they are, and figure out what the climate conditions were like in that particular year. So here we have a tree that was actually hit by lightning and so it was cut down, where we can see this phenomenon ourselves. And you can see this yourself too if you ever come across a tree like this. So we can see that some of the growth rings are thicker, and those would have been summers where climate conditions were more favorable for growth, when it was warmer and wetter. And we can see some groups of rings where they're a little narrower. The tree didn't grow as much. And so we can infer that climate was actually less conducive to growth. It would have been colder or drier. And so instead of just using one tree, we can gather a whole group of trees from around New England, in fact, all the way across over to Europe. We can see how these, root, these widths of the rings change through time and we can actually figure out what the climate was like all the way back in 1816. So we're gonna do that first, figure out just how cold it was in 1816. Was it really a year without a summer? And then we're gonna look at the ice core record to see if we can figure out what the heck was happening. Why was it so unusually cold in 1816? And can that help us in the future as we try and fight global warming? So let's get to it.